This kite isn't just soaring gracefully, it's also generating energy from the wind. If you're like me, you probably are thinking, that's neat, but don't we already have an effective and reliable way of capturing wind energy? And yes, wind turbines have been the big ol' workhorses for decades. But that's part of the problem. Wind turbines are both physically and financially massive. Each one costs a minimum of hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that's before we take into account shipping, installation, and maintenance. Goofy as it might sound, airborne wind energy systems or AWES like this kite could be a cheaper, more nimble alternative to the steel titans that we're used to. But are AWES really ready for takeoff, or are they grounded for good? I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. This video is brought to you by Ground News. This is Kite Power's AWES flying high above the town of Bangor Airs, Ireland. AWES are a type of wind energy device that uses kites and other similar flying objects to sustainably generate energy from the wind at a fraction of a turbine's price. They're small enough to travel, with most designs able to fit in a standard shipping container. You don't need a massive construction team or a foundation to install them, and on top of that, most can be fully deployed in less than 24 hours. Kite Power's maiden voyage, which was a first-of-its-kind test, proved successful when it provided the small community in Bangor Eris with energy. It was even able to supply energy in spite of the massive storm Aeon that rolled through the region causing devastating blackouts. But for me the most fascinating part is that AWES are able to soar high above other wind-based energy generators, and they're able to access powerful but untapped airstreams. I mean, generally the higher up you go, the stronger and steadier the winds are. A 2013 study on the geophysical limits of wind power suggested that wind turbines located on the Earth's surface can harness kinetic energy at a rate of at least 400 terawatts while high-altitude wind power devices have the potential to capture over 1,800 terawatts. And to truly understand why some companies are leaving turbines to go fly a kite, let's take a look at where wind turbines are lacking. But don't get your line twisted, wind turbines are really good at what they do. They don't require all that much land and can be installed without significantly disrupting farming activities. I've actually seen an energy company pull this off in person, which you can check out in a previous video. Plus, turbines offer low operating costs with components that last more than 25 years. That's a pretty pleasing package as is. So where is the room for improvement? Well, there's a whale of a problem. In the sense that wind turbines are just really, really big. Your typical turbine is a little over 103 meters, or 339 feet tall. That's taller than the Statue of Liberty, but they get even bigger than that. In 2023, the average diameter of a newly installed turbine rotor was over 133 meters, which is 438 feet. That's longer than a football field. As you can imagine, the sheer size makes transporting these parts notoriously difficult and expensive. Again, I've seen this in person. It's kind of eye-opening. To make sure that a large investment in wind turbines pays off, we need to set them up in the best conditions possible. Ideally, they prefer annual average wind speeds of at least 9 miles per hour, smooth round hills, open plains, or the sea. If you can place them near features like mountain passes that funnel and intensify the wind, it's even better. It's a lot, but clearly not insurmountable. But even when you've snatched up that perfect parcel for your turbines, there's still another hurdle. The neighbors. Not everyone's a big fan of big fans. Plenty of people are totally in favor of wind power, as long as it's in your backyard and not theirs. As a result, wind farms often end up far away from the cities that need them most. Because energy is lost in transmission, it's not as ideal as it could be. That takes us back to AWES, an umbrella term that covers a lot of different working principles. For the airborne component, you've got everything from kites to balloons to the hybrids known as kitoons, as in kite balloons. And yes, they're actually called that. Some AWES work aerostatically, relying on something naturally floaty, like a balloon, to support the power generating elements. The aerodynamic variety are usually kites that fly in crosswind patterns to maximize wind pressure. These systems can adjust their altitude and trajectory to optimize the wind conditions, or even smart launch and dock themselves if the winds get a little too rowdy. Though having a trained operator is usually the way to go. So why bother going through all of that? Well, the lack of a tower means that you can fly to the altitude where the wind is best on any given day. This freedom lets AWES access wind streams that towers just can't reach. Now, AWS can soar up to 800 meters, but here's where it gets really interesting. Generally, the higher you go, the faster the wind. The mechanics means that as little as a two-fold increase in wind speed could lead to up to eight times more power generation. According to a study from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the Carnegie Institution, 
The theoretical global limit of wind power at high altitude is about four and a half times greater than what could be harvested by turbines that are stuck closer to the surface. Plus, because turbines and AWS aren't competing for the same wind resources, they could actually complement each other. And unlike turbines, which are stuck at one height, a kite gives operators the flexibility to move wherever the winds are most favorable. For my money, though, what really separates AWS from turbines is their portability. Most of these systems fit inside of a single shipping container and can go anywhere a truck can. There's no foundation needed, and setup is under 24 hours. This lets AWS pitch hit in situations where a turbine could be ridiculous remote research outposts, hospitals in regions prone to blackouts, or rapid disaster response. Now, all these advantages translate into a promising levelized cost of energy, or LCOE, at least in theory. This metric compares lifetime energy generation against installation and operational costs. By this measure, AWS look very promising. A 2023 Delft University study estimated that a 50 megawatt kite farm would use 70% less material than a traditional wind farm of the same capacity over 20 years. Now, all these perks might have you wondering, if AWS is cost-effective and cool, then where the heck are they? Well, the technology is still in its infancy, but there are some early success stories to dive into. In fact, let me show you exactly how companies like Kite Power and SkySails are making this work in the real world. But before we dive into that, let me show you something about how we get our information on these renewable energy advances. Depending on where you read about solar or wind innovations, they're either revolutionary breakthroughs that will transform energy, or just another overhyped green tech bubble. When stories mix cutting-edge science, billion-dollar investments, and climate claims, how do you know if you're getting the full picture? That's where today's sponsor, Ground News, comes in. Created by a former NASA engineer, Ground News pulls from over 50,000 sources and breaks down political bias, credibility, ownership, and even financial incentives behind the coverage. A great example? Take any major story about renewable energy policy, like this one about Trump not approving solar and wind energy projects. With one click, I can see a summary, political bias, ownership details, and a factuality breakdown for every outlet that's covering it. The center-leaning source keeps it straightforward with just the facts. The left-leaning headline uses emotional language like rages and panics, painting chaos and instability. Meanwhile, the right-leaning source frames it as decisive leadership, focusing on economic justification and fixing past mistakes. Same story, three completely different narratives. If you're watching my channel, you probably like digging deeper into the science and technology behind these stories. Ground News helps you compare coverage, spot bias, and catch what others might miss. I especially like the blind spot feed. It shows stories underreported by one side of the spectrum. It's helped me recognize my own blind spots and understand the nuance behind the headlines. For a limited time, you can get the same plan that I use for nearly half off. Just head to ground.news slash undecided, or scan the QR code to save 40% off their Vantage plan. Thanks to Ground News and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now let's get back to those kites that are generating actual electricity in the real world. Let's return to Kite Power and its AWS flying high above Bangor Airs, Ireland. This is a Dutch company spun out of Delft University by astronaut Vubo Okels. Its first proof of concept came about in 2007, and now its team is close to commercializing their tech. Kite Power's AWS is one of the aerodynamic variety. It has a fiberglass skeleton undergirding a 60 square meter inflatable wing. It generates energy working kind of like a big yo-yo. The kite spools up, up, and away, about 400 meters away. It flies upwards into the crosswind in that figure eight pattern. This pulls the tether wound around a drum safely on the ground, spinning it up. By doing this, the kite can generate between 2.5 and four tons of force, rotating that drum at high speed and generating up to 30 kilowatts of electricity per hour. After 45 seconds, the kite reaches its maximum height, and it tacks like a ship so that the push of the wind is minimized. Then it's winched back in, rewinding the yo-yo for the next go. And this is a very important step because reeling the kite back in costs energy. The less energy we spend fighting the wind, the more energy that we gross. And speaking of energy, it's all stored in a 336 kilowatt hour battery. That's both nice for energy storage and potentially critical for the kind of off-grid or emergency situations that AWS seem especially suited to. And Kite Power isn't resting on its laurels. The company has another test coming up, this time with a commercial partner on their home turf in the Netherlands. A construction company is planning to use the Kite to charge electric trucks and excavators in a civil infrastructure project. Kite Power isn't alone. On July 1st, Germany-based SkySails launched the maiden flight of its AWS at Tai Power's Changbin photovoltaic field. It uses the same yo-yo principles as Kite Power system, but with some notable differences in scale. 
They have a larger model called Kyo that depending on wind conditions will be able to generate up to 1,780 megawatt hours of clean energy per year, which Skyscales claims is enough electricity for 600 households. There's also an even larger system in the works with an alleged annual yield of 6,580 megawatt hours and a cycle power of up to 1,300 kilowatts. Skysales also has some pretty creative ideas on how and where to deploy its tech. For starters, the company seems very into hybridizing its device by putting it right to work next to other renewables like on solar farms or wind farms. The team is also exploring the potential of attaching its system to the back of a large watercraft like container ships. The idea is that its S-Class AWS could capture energy from seaborne winds and funnel it back into the ship to reduce fuel consumption. An AWS could be a welcome addition to the crew. Considering that large ships often run on some of the dirtiest and most polluting hydrocarbons available, so-called bunker fuel. Sadly, it's not all smooth sailing. Despite the promise of AWS, the technology is still too young to be top flight, and there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed. As a study from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and the Department of Energy points out, this newness means that everything from design to manufacture to supply chain, logistics, installation, operations, and even maintenance still needs to be nailed down. There's also questions of longevity. Wind turbines have a fairly simple working principle that comes with standardized components rated to last 20 plus years. But with all their figure eights and yo-yoing, a major question for AWS is how their lifespans and complexity of their components are gonna stack up against their peers. And the answer to that question is going to have a major effect on the much touted LCOE. Then there's safety. These types of kites are large and heavy. So a stalled one could be quite dangerous. And between mid-air collisions, the kite slipping its tether and extreme weather events, there's a lot that could go wrong. Now to be fair, the fact that Kite Power's test run survived Storm Aowen and kept producing power before, during, and after that record-breaking cyclone is cause to be optimistic on that front. But how many Aowens can it survive? The Witch King of Angmar couldn't even handle one. Ah! The hope, however, is that smart systems can circumvent this problem. At the end of the day, the biggest issue these systems have is that they simply don't match up to the power generation of traditional turbines. An average turbine would generate over 843 megawatt hours per month. According to the United States Geological Survey, that's enough for more than 940 US homes. That would be 10,116 megawatt hours a year, far outpacing the 1,780 megawatt hour annual yield of something like the Kyo. Of course, comparing one AWES to one turbine isn't very fair. We need several of them flying in synchronization to match up to that one turbine. But that's going to complicate the economic and safety concerns even more. So where does that leave AWES? Well, despite the challenges, the outlook is pretty positive. Again, I want to underscore the fact that the tech is in its infancy. With Kite Power running its early but seemingly successful test in Ireland and SkySail's maiden flight in Taiwan, we're probably looking at a technological readiness level of about a six. That's a fully functional prototype or representational model. That said, with early tests going well, we could be on the cusp of a TRL of seven. While it seems like it'll be years before AWS can compete with turbines, if ever, I still think they have a very unique and well-defined niche. The fact that they can access those extra high up, high powered wind streams that no one else can is cause for excitement. They also have the opportunity to fill in gaps in rapid response and emergency. And we'll see what other weird applications pop up like SkySail's back of the boat proposal. But what do you think? Will AWS start to soar or are they bound to come crashing down to earth? You can also check out the extended cut of this video over on Patreon and a big welcome to new Supporter Plus member, Noel McWilliam. If you'd like to join, the link's down in the description. Be sure to listen to my follow-up podcast Still To Be Determined while we'll keep this conversation going. Keep your mind open, stay curious, and I'll see you in the next one.